If you want to open your Bibles to uh, a very easy place to find, Genesis 1.1. <laughs> We're going to look again at that. Why is Genesis so important? Or, or uh, my subtitle is, why did we spend 21 months studying this book? And I did have to go back and look at my, uh, my records. And, and of course, uh, anytime that uh, you study something and then there's a review, if you've been to school, you know the, the review is because there's a test coming, right? And there is a test coming, but it's not going to be here and it's not going to be from me. It's going to be from your friends, your family members, your coworkers. The next time there's a hurricane, the next time there's a disaster, they're going to say, if there's a God and he's a God of love and he created everything, why did he allow this to happen? The next time there's something, uh, atrocity going on. If there's a God of love, why does he allow such evil into this world? And Genesis answers those questions. Uh, the next time we, uh, we, we hear about the Mars rover and they find something that looks like it might have been water. And if it was water, there might have been life. And if there was life, what kind of life would it have been? And if we know what it would have been, what will it, why, why did we go to these extremes? Because scientists have no explanation for the origins of life. How do you get, how do you get life from nothing? And it's a, it's a big problem for them. <laughs> and of course, uh, the problem for us as believers is that there is never allowed a debate uh, on, on the issue. Uh, and when there is, if you get a chance to see one, you feel bad for the atheist. You feel bad for the uh, evolutionary position uh, because uh, you just feel like uh, it's Darth Vader against a, a Boy Scout with his little knife out because uh, one person has reason and evidence and the other person has uh, speculation and a lot of faith. And, uh, and, and um, the speculation and a lot of faith is the uh, Darwinian naturalistic view, not the, uh, not the biblical view. Genesis answers those questions, the questions of, of uh, origin. And of course, then our third point is going to be as we look at creation uh, and the cause of evil in this world, we'll look at the cure for man's predicament. So let's, uh, let's look at, again, Genesis 1 1. The creation, we'd say, is by God's design. It answers the question of origins. In the beginning, God created the heavens uh, in the earth. And of course, uh, we often quote this and make reference to the fact that if you can believe the first three words of the Bible, uh, then everything else should be kind of downhill from there, whether it's uh, uh, Jonah and, and the fish that swallowed him, the walls of Jericho falling down, the virgin birth, whatever it might be. Uh, if you get this part right, that in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God created. Again, the naturalistic, materialistic world, metaphysical view believes that we're in a closed system. This is it. We all are in the time-space continuum. This is all that we can see. It's all there ever is. It's all there ever will be. And that's it. We're in a closed system. They do not allow for the idea of the supernatural because they don't believe anything exists outside the time-space continuum. But as we study Genesis, we saw that God created the universe. God created time and space. He created it and was able to do that because he exists outside of it. Because he exists outside of it, he's able then to prove that to us by telling us things that will happen in the future in exacting details hundreds and even thousands of years before they happen. Because he is God in the beginning God. And then it says that he created, that's the Hebrew word bara, which means that uh, he created out of nothing. Out of nothing he created everything. Uh, he simply spoke them into existence. And, uh, and we see that uh, uh, all of the Trinity is involved in creation. We can go back and look at the Spirit uh, over the waters and uh, in references to uh, God doing this and, uh, and uh, every aspect of the Trinity. In Genesis 1.26 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And of course, uh, a Jewish view of that would be it's God and the angels. But certainly uh, we as New Testament believers would see it's a reference that we believe to the, to the Trinity. But again, the verb bara, create, uh, also contains the idea of creating something out of nothing. It also uh, conveys the idea of effortlessness. It was nothing for God to simply speak creation into uh, existence. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen 
were not made of things which are visible. He didn't take something that was already there and simply bring those parts or pieces together to create something uh, he actually created out of nothing. And this, uh, again, is the answer to this idea of the philosophical, materialistic, naturalistic view uh, that uh, really, again, uh, as I said, and uh, not jokingly, uh, it requires a lot of faith to believe in. Because when you don't have reasonable answers, then you must have faith. Uh, we believe that the, our view of, the, of origins is reasonable, but still requires faith. God gives us enough evidence so that we can say our faith is reasonable. But he doesn't give us so much evidence so that it does not require faith. It does require faith. But our view is much more reasonable than, than the alternative, and it gives an explanation to how things came about. For, uh, for many years, the, uh, the naturalistic material view was certainly uh, quoted by Carl Sagan, the astronomer, quote, philosopher, uh, as he began his uh, TV show each week, Cosmos, by saying, uh, the, uh, again, the cosmos is all there is, all there was, all there is, and all there ever will believe. Believing, as most, most astronomers in his era, that uh, the universe was, was infinite. It had always existed. The problem with that now is we've got better telescopes. <laughs> and we can see the universe expanding. And everything that uh, we know now believes that the universe had a beginning. Again, the test for you, when your family or friends or somebody comes up to you uh, and asks you about your faith in Jesus Christ, or you want to share your faith in Jesus Christ, usually you can't begin with the resurrection of Jesus because they don't even know who he is. You really have to begin with this question. Did the universe have a beginning? And if you can show them that it had a beginning, then it had to have a beginner. As Ted Koppel once said on Nightline, if there was a big bang, there had to be a big banger. There had to be a first cause of everything that we see. It could not have just, out of an explosion, happened. And, uh, and we can almost, it's, it's easy to, to make fun of the evolutionists in this uh, is the idea in video clips and so forth that you have this major explosion <laughs> in space and then suddenly you have complex DNA that, uh, that comes out of it. Uh, it's just kind of beyond the pale that uh, uh, mathematically or otherwise that could, uh, uh, that could ever happen. So it's a, great, it's a great, great way to share your faith. Again, and I've, I've shared that point with folks that are Buddhist background, Hindu backgrounds, and just simply say, but do you believe the universe at a beginning? Because you're studying with this guy at UC Berkeley, for example, one of our cousins, who uh, was about 14 or 15 years old, that claimed to be God, uh, and so forth. And I asked him, that, does he claim deity? Yes, he does. You know, well, very interesting. I said, well, let me ask you this. Does the universe have a beginning? Uh, well, I've never really thought about it. Well, a lot of leading scientists hold that view today based on the second law of thermo thermodynamics. The sun is burning down. It's not getting brighter. It's, it's dissipating. The things do not go simply from, from, from uh, disorder to order. They go the other way around. I've always said that uh, the person that holds the evolu evolutionary view does not own a home, especially a garage because I can clean mine up and it can look really good. I can come back a few months later and it can go from order to disorder. Things do that in the natural world as well. You can make other, other arguments. I give you a, phil a philosophical argument at the time saying that if a man fell into a bottomless pit, could he crawl out? Now, I know it takes an extra cup of Starbucks to kind of figure that one out, but no, he couldn't because he, could he could never be from the bottom to start. We could never arrive at the now if things went infinitely that way and infinitely that way. We would have no time and no measure of time. The universe had to have a, a beginning, therefore it had a beginner. And then I could say to this person or others that I've talked to, if it had a beginning, it had a beginner, we would call that beginner God. Therefore, I'm not saying he's personal. I'm not saying he's moral at this point. I'm just saying there had to be a first cause that we would call God that was so powerful that he could create the universe. Now, let me ask you this. The young guy that you're studying with that claims to be God, is he the creator of the universe? Well, no. Is Buddha the creator? Did he ever claim that? No. Then can he be God? Because there's only one. We don't live in a polyverse. We live in a universe. There's not many. There's just one based on what we can see uh, around us. Therefore, 
I don't think he can be God. And if he's not God, I really don't think you should be worshiping, do you? And I've actually had Buddhists as well as Hindus say, agree with me on that point. They weren't ready to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I can move on into the idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the evidence, but at least they would hear what I had to say because it was reasonable to them and it answers the questions of origin, which, which uh, Genesis does. Philip Johnson in one of his books says of uh, evolutionary theory, it is defended by some against all logic for fear that a divine foot might get in the door. <laughs> they, they just don't even want to hear uh, the idea of uh, what we would refer to as intelligent design. Michael Bay's book in 1996, Darwin's Black Box, uh, kind of really opened up a can of worms, we might say, for the uh, Darwinian evolutionists. He says in it that biological systems at their molecular level have paralyzed science's attempt to explain their origins. Things are just simply too complex. William Dembski in his book, Mere Creation, says that Darwin gave us a creation story, one in which God was absent and undirected natural processes did all the work. That creation story has held sway more than, for more than 100 years, but it's on its way out. And it's very interesting, even after several generations of teaching only uh, the evolutionary model within science and our public school systems, that still most people do not believe it. It's just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't ring true. Uh, Malcolm McGregoridge in his book, The End of Christianism, said, I myself am, am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially to the extent to which it has been applied, will be one of the greatest jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious a hypothesis could be accepted. And just to be clear what we're saying and what we're not saying, the evolutionists, when they give you evidence for their view, will give you evidence of evolution on a, <coughs> on a horizontal level. But again, the Bible teaches that. In the beginning, God created things in their species. One dog that becomes many dogs, one apple that becomes many kinds of apples, according to its seed is the, the language that Moses uses there. We would not disagree with the idea of evolution and things changing based on env environment and genetics on a horizontal level. Where we disagree with the evolutionists is the idea of that change happening on a vertical level. Species jumping to other species, uh, jumping to other species, because we just simply don't find it. You can check the geological record, you can look at fossils, you can look at every piece of physical evidence you can find out there, and you cannot find a transitionary species anywhere. There is no link to link us to chimpanzees or whatever it might be. You don't find a species where, you know, the hippopotamus becomes a giraffe or whatever it might be. There are no jumps. They do not exist. And that is the basis for evolutionary thought in their particular model. Our view of creation should cause us to, well, should cause us to worship God. Nehemiah 9.5 says, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name. Here's why. Which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. Why? You made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. So again, our answer to the question of origins is that God created it out of nothing. He simply spoke it into uh, existence. And we would say also that he did it uh, in six days. Now, when we went through this, you can tell I'm moving fast. We've got to go through the whole book. When we went through this, I actually presented six different views of the idea of creation. Everything from, uh, from theistic evolution, gap theories, and, and some of the other views. Of course, I presented my view, which is the correct view, uh, that it is uh, a literal six days. And uh, this is not, not a hill to die on. Uh, there's a lot of good Christians that hold different views. But at least I want to give you, again, the five reasons that we lifted right out of David Hawkins' book, The Rise and Fall of Civilizations, now been reprinted as The Beginning. Hopefully David will have a copy with him here next week. That argues for a much younger uh, earth. And again, I don't have time to regress totally. Uh, but I, I don't see the earth as being only, only 6,000 years old based on the genealogies. We show there's gaps in the genealogy, so we really can't hold to that date. We believe it's very young and not very old. 
And there's a lot of science uh, behind that that would hold that view as well. But we look at it, we look at it simply from a textual point of view. There's no way that Moses writing this was thinking of a gap theory. There's no way that Moses writing this, the six days, was thinking about six geological ages. It just doesn't come across in his writing. Uh, it's not there in the text. First, we'd say because, reason number one, the normal usage of the word. The Hebrew word for day is yom. And remember, you put the I-M on the end, yomim, for the plural. Uh, it's uh, used 1,900 times in the Bible. 65 times it refers to a period other than a 24-hour period. So from that argument, you could say, well, I believe it's day ages or longer periods of times. And it was one of the rare exceptions in the use of that day. The problem you have is point number two. It's used with a numerical adjective, as in verse 3 then God, of chapter 1. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. There it is. There's our word, yom. And we have a numerical adjective, one, in front of it. When a numerical adjective is used with the word yom or yom mean, it always refers to a 24-hour period. It occurs 700 times. No exceptions. So you're kind of you're kind of stuck right there. If you want to take this and somehow make it into theistic evolution, then you have to say, I figured this out. Moses couldn't, of course, uh, but I did. You would have to say, of course. Now you have a problem with the idea of the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Moses knew what he was talking about. Three, you have the phrase evening and morning. Some would argue the phrase evening and morning simply means beginning and, uh, and evening. But as we look at it in other places in Scripture, we find again that it, that it means uh, day and evening, as in, again, our word yomim. Daniel 8.14 says, And he said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. There's our days, our same word, again, used exactly the same way, with a numerical value. We know that Daniel was talking about a set number of days. He wasn't talking about 2,300 geological periods. He was just talking about 24-hour periods. For the relationship of the days of creation to the six-day work week, Exodus 28, Moses, our uh, writer, again, chapter 8, ver uh, chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Shabbat, or the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and to do your work. But the seventh day is the Shabbat of the Lord. So we're supposed to work six days. Are we supposed to work six geological ages before we get a day off? I don't think so. I think it means six days. Uh, and then you have the relationship of the Sabbath day itself, which becomes the part of the sign of the covenant under the Mosaic covenant. They would rest on the Sabbath day. It is tied directly in here as well. Genesis 2.2, 2, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work which God had created and made. God works six days. He rests on the seventh when he wants to establish a covenant relationship with the Jewish people going into the land under Moses. He makes the seventh day rest tied directly to Genesis as the day they were at rest. David Hawking says of this in his book, the Sabbath day is a period of 24 hours and it is based on the seventh day of creation, the day God ended his work of creation. So you, again, you could say that you could choose one of these other views, but boy, you have to really wrestle it out of the text to make that work. And when you begin to do that, you're really undermining the inspiration and the authority of Scripture, and I don't think that's a road that uh, we want to go down. I don't have a problem with the fact that, again, in the beginning, God, that he could speak things uh, into existence. And... Uh, uh, it, it doesn't baffle me at all that he could do it in six days. I doubt if he even needed that long. It's just simply, I think he set up a model for us and rested, uh, and uh, our whole work week is built around this idea of remembering God in creation, remembering that we should rest on the Sabbath or day as God rested from the work that he has done as well. Again, creation uh, by God's design answers the, the questions of origin 
uh, in terms of it was a work of God. Uh, we would hold, I would hold, that uh, he completed it in six, six days. Uh, secondly, the cause of evil in the world. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why did that hurricane that just went across uh, uh, Okinawa cause so much damage? Uh, if there's a God of love, then why is there so much evil in the world? Okay, these are all answered uh, in the book of Genesis. In chapter 3, through the descent of, uh, of the first couple, Adam and Eve, from innocence to guilt, we find first the cause of evil begins by challenging God's word there in the first three verses. We're now in chapter 3. You're saying we're only in chapter 3. I don't think we're going to get through all 50. <laughs> Trust me, we're going to move rapidly soon. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You should not eat of every tree of, uh, tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So again, the the cunning beast brings the challenge. And we know from uh, Revelation passages 12, 9, 22, this is the devil. This is the devil again. There's nothing uh, in terms of the serpent and this word that indicates evil. It simply indicates shrewd or, or cunning. Uh, and Satan, again, speaking through uh, this particular creature to Eve to try to challenge God's word. Did God really say is God's word really true? Can you really trust God? That was the, uh, the first uh, uh, temptation that was, uh, that was there. Uh, we also want to make clear what God isn't doing here again. James 1.13 says, again, what is the cause of temptation? We're very clear that it's Satan, that it's not God. John, uh, James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he himself uh, tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own evil desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, gives birth to sin, sin when it's full grown, brings forth death. Satan is the tempter. He comes to Eve. He continues to come to us in the same way. The cause of evil began uh, by, by, again, challenging God's word, and then his character, the integrity of God's character, uh, is uh, impugned here as well in verse 4. But the servant said to the woman, You will not surely die. In the Hebrew, it's again the word lo, meaning not, in front of the God's declaration. Not, you shall surely die, is the idea, and it's emphatic. In other words, you can't trust God. After all, if you eat from this tree, you'll gain the, the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be God, like God himself. That's what uh, Satan says to Eve, doesn't he? He challenges God's word. He impugns God's character, and people still do that today. Satan still does that today. That's one of the questions we're asked. A God of love would not really judge mankind in the end, would he? Isn't it everybody going to heaven, some would say. But again, that's part of the thing. God says in the very beginning, if you do this, then this will happen to you. There will be repercussions. You will surely die. And they didn't drop dead on the spot, did they? Physically, they did not die then, but they would die eventually. What died right then was they died spiritually, no longer having that communion and relationship with God uh, that they had before. Their spirit died. It lay dormant, and that's true of us as well. We're born into sin with a sin nature, and we need to be born again of the spirit so that we can have a relationship with God who is a God of spirit and truth. Notice that uh, Adam is on the scene. We made reference to that, that uh, when uh, Satan addresses Eve, he uses the plural uh, form of you, which implies that Adam's around. It's you. I'm saying this to, to you in a plural sense. <laughs> he's the only other guy on the planet, so we figure he's there. And, uh, but he's passive. He's just watching this whole thing go down. Uh, she takes from the fruit, she eats, she doesn't drop over dead on the spot. So he jumps in and, and willfully now, not deceived, and the Bible's clear on that, willfully he just commits sin. The Apostle Paul puts it this way, uh, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, First Timothy 2.14. He mentions it also in Romans 5. He sins willfully, eyes open, without hesitation. 
and the repercussion of that sin and why we have evil in this world continue to this very day. Paul says, classic Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, or mankind, because all sin. Have all sinned? Yeah, everybody's dying, Paul says. That's the evidence. you got a guy that's uh, a couple thousand years old, I guess he doesn't have any sin. But that doesn't happen. Everybody dies because sin. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men. Why? Because all sin. All sin and come short of the glory of God. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Two things happen. Our nature is very changed. We, we are not born just having this relationship with God. Uh, our spirit is there. It lies dormant. We need to be born again uh, as a work of God's spirit in us. We have a tendency to be self-centered, not other-centered. Uh, we have a tendency and a propensity to, to do evil because we're born as, uh, as sinners. Uh, when we sin, it proves that we were sinners. It doesn't make us sins. We were born into sin, uh, the Bible declares. The, that's part of the problem. Paul also goes on and describes the fact that all creation itself was marred. Why are there hurricanes? Why are there storms? Why are there earthquakes? The answer is, it's not the world that God created. Satan came into this world uh, after he rebelled against God, this magnificent, glorious creature that God had created, one of the most powerful angels in heaven. He rebelled. He wanted to be worshipped himself. He came to earth and he tempted uh, the first man and woman and brought them into sin. And when they did, it changed everything for everyone. Death came to us. A self-centeredness and a sin nature entered our own hearts. And not only that, all of creation is changed and it's marred by this fall of man and what happened. We certainly can still see God's design, but it's not the way he meant it to be. When I was still uh, building stained glass windows for a living, one of the things that I would do sometimes is do rest restoration work and sometimes that would include um, kind of very interesting things uh, when, when uh, some lunatic went on a rampage and punched holes in the windows at St. Andrew's Cathedral uh, and then I would kind of have to kind of imagine and figure based on the style of work what was there before. Don't have to have any pictures of this, do you? And uh, kind of recreate the windows. It's a challenge and uh, and I, I love that kind of stuff. Sometimes it was uh, a little more mundane, though. Uh, I had a friend, and we would do stuff together occasionally. He got a call. Went down to the spaghetti factory. Have you ever been to the spaghetti factory? Lots of, uh, you know, turn-of-the-century stained glass there and everything. And if you're ever on the side where the cable car is and you look up, you'll see these big stained glass chandeliers. And one night, one of those chandeliers fell. No safety wire, just the electrical hooked <laughs> into the box. They were pretty big and pretty heavy. No one was there. Uh, glass went all over the place. And, uh, and to examine it, you could look at it, and, and, uh, and though it didn't look like much, it still had a, a metal frame, though it was slightly bent. The glass was shattered and gone. But we could tell where the glass was. We could tell the shape of the glass. Uh, and he worked on a part of it because they wanted it back in there pretty quick. And I recreated all that, what we call bent panels. In other words, where the glass comes down and slopes and it actually bends. Uh, by find, find, trying to figure out the shape, uh, creating a mold, cutting the glass, then bring it, put it in a kiln, bring it up to temperature so that it's, it uh, drapes and folds into the mold. And then if it works, then do it six more times and, uh, and we're home free. Uh, and we were able to do that, and it's back in there today, and it has a safety wire on it. You don't have to worry if you're sitting under it. Uh, my point is, is that we could look at it and still, it was shattered, but we could still see design. Uh, this earth, this universe is not what God created, but still we can see design. And we can know about the designer, how glorious and how great and how powerful and how majestic he is simply by looking at a marred picture of his creation. That's why the psalmist can write, the heavens declare the glory of God. So creation is by God's design. It answers the question of origin. It's a work of God. We would believe in a young earth that it was completed in six days. Uh, the cause of evil in the world uh, is simply because things changed. Satan coming down and tempting Adam and Eve was a game changer. It's why there's hurricanes and earthquakes 
Uh, it's part of what happened. It's also be why there's evil people in this world, which then would beg the question, of course, but God being all-powerful, and since God is a God of love, and he knows that there's evil in this world, it's entered this world, why doesn't he just destroy all the evil people in this world? Good idea, except we're all evil <laughs> under God's standards. And he could have done that and started all over, but he chose not to. He came up with a cure for the problem, we would say is our third C there, the cure for man's predicament. And what do we know about that from Genesis? Well, we have the first promise of it in Genesis 3.15, where uh, we have God laying out the consequences of the sin in the world, but he brings hope with it. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You know, if he kind of helps us with this word translated bruise here in the New King James, he will crush your head, you will strike his heel. So right from the very beginning, we would say the cure for man's predicament begins with this promise. And it's going to come through the woman, through Eve. And when we did our study, we talked about the fact that when she first has Cain, and then she has Abel, she's thinking he's the one, maybe he's the one, that the Messiah is going to come right then. Uh, but it's going to be a, a descendant. It's not going to be a group of people. Seed here is not mean plural. It means singular. Uh, and again, uh, just to give uh, you two uh, references to, to that. Uh, in 250 B.C., when Jewish scholars translated the Bible into Greek, uh, they saw fit to translate it, uh, this word seed, in the singular. They believed in 250 B.C. that he will crush your head. Hebrew scholar Jack Collins examined every use of the word seed when it means offspring and found that when the word is singular, as here, it always denotes a specific descendant. Uh, when it's an individual, the pronoun will be masculine. He says it would be fair to read this as God's threat to the snake of an individual who engaged the snake in combat and win. Right from the very beginning, God says, I will send a person, a he, a male, he will come from the woman. He will be a descendant. And he, single-handedly, not with a group of people, not with a great army, he single-handedly will go into combat against Satan and destroy Satan. He will be, have a wound inflicted to him in a minor sense in terms like a snake biting your heel, but he will crush the head of the snake. And he did that on the cross, didn't he? That's where he destroyed the power of Satan. And as we come to faith in him, what is destroyed is the power of of, and the penalty of sin. The power of sin sends me to hell instead of to heaven. It keeps me from living the kind of life that God intended for me to live. And of course, Paul echoes this in Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say into seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So the cure for man's predicament begins with a promise uh, it also includes a, a promise uh, of a covenant. And if you want to turn to Genesis 12, we'll jump. And certainly we spent an entire sermon. We spent a couple in this chapter, one in particular on the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, but again, here's the promise as it gets defined. He is going to be this person who destroyed Satan, who crushes his head. Uh, and he's going to be a physical descendant of Abraham. We find that as part of the covenant. Verse 2, I will, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God makes this uh, covenant with him. And again, just from a, a, a biblical dictionary of the idea of covenant, we don't use this word in our everyday conversation uh, there, Nelson says that a covenant in the biblical sense implies much more than a contract or simple agreement. A contract always has an end date, while a covenant is a permanent arrangement. Another, another difference is that a contract generally involves only a part of the person, like a skill, while a covenant covers a person's total being. God, you remember in that cunning covenant scene where they cut, literally cut covenant, only God passes through, uh, not Abraham. God commits his total being to make this promise come true. The other thing that we saw about it, it's not only just a covenant, we said that it was, <clears throat> that it was unconditional. The Mosaic Covenant, 
God tells Moses, if the people go into the land, they'll be blessed. If they do this, they do this, do this, do this. But if they don't, they don't follow my law, they're out of there. They're going into captivity. It was conditional. This is unconditional. It's just, I'm going to do this. It's not conditioned on, on anything. And uh, again, we might say, uh, what, if, uh, what if Abraham was a liar? <laughs> well, he was. What if his son was a liar? Well, actually, he was too. What if his son was a liar? Well, he was also a cheat. What if the greater son through Messiah is going to come through was an adulterer, David? Well, he was too. It wasn't conditioned on them. It was conditioned on what God would do through them and for them uh, in terms of this covenant. Uh, we would say the covenant is broken down into two aspects, personal blessing and then a bigger picture, the global, the personal. I'll make, your, uh, I'll make you a great nation. God did that. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. We saw that in our studies of Abraham. And uh, you shall be a blessing, and certainly we saw that in our studies of the life of Abraham as well. The global blessing, which really uh, is so important to us, verse 3, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, and God does, does that. And we see the principle worked out in our studies of Genesis. Melchizedek and Abimelech were blessed for honoring Abraham. Hagar was cut off because of her despising Sarah. The Canaanites, Canaanites were eventually completely eliminated as they were the enemies of Abraham's physical descendants. Remember, they, they become the Carthaginians and are absolutely 100% destroyed uh, by, by the Romans. And we went into some detail about that particular battle, which I found fascinating and probably put most of you to sleep. But nonetheless, <laughs> we went through it. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. His, his physical descendant you know, becomes a blessing to the whole world, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. People through the centuries now around the world have been blessed as they come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, again, it was not dependent upon anything Abraham or his descendants uh, would do. This is God completely committing himself to the covenant. Uh, we would say it's based on God's uh, uh, faithfulness uh, of his own character, but also his own word. Nations have risen and fallen based on their treatment of the Jewish people, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Greeks were mighty until they took over the uh, Jerusalem, uh, desecrated the temple, and eventually they were destroyed. The Roman Empire was a great empire until they destroyed the temple and killed the Jews there. Spain was considered a great empire at one time until they began through the Spanish Inquisition uh, to persecute the Jewish people, which led one Jewish person to get on a ship and his name was Columbus, and head across the Atlantic to try to find a free world where there would not be persecution. Uh, you probably read all about that in history, of course. And then there was a guy named Napoleon who was a mighty conqueror who initially had gave a favor to the Jews, but in a frustration over his attempt uh, to conquer further down into Egypt and North Africa, it didn't go according to plan, and in his frustration on his way back up through <coughs> Israel, uh, destroyed the Jewish people. Uh, again, Germany was a world power at one time until they persecuted the Jews. Great Britain ruled the world, it said, at one time. The sun never set on the British Empire until they turned their back on the Jewish people uh, during after World War I, promising them a homeland, and after deserting them when they were trying to flee uh, the Holocaust. The United States, I believe, is the greatest nation on the earth as long as we support the state of Israel which uh, gives us real, real concern uh, given the state of affairs politically in the world right now. Uh, again, it's all based on God's character, his faithfulness, and his desire to bless the world. All the nations will be blessed through Jesus Christ. So there's a promise. Uh, it includes uh, a person. There's a promise based on a covenant. And then the third thing to cure for man's predicament would be predicted in a prophecy. And we just went through this a few weeks ago. Genesis 49, remember Jacob on his deathbed. He speaks of things in the latter days. And he uses his son, things about his sons, things about their lives. And God speaks through him and predicts things that will happen in the future. 
and we find out there, now we know that this person is going to come through Abraham and he's going to come in the lineage of Judah. Uh, and uh, we find that in Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him be the obedience of the people. And we gave a couple of applications uh, of that as we went through it. Just the idea that, uh, uh, that uh, the Jewish people and the rabbis believed that Shiloh, the Messiah, would come. And he would come while they still had that ability to rule themselves, even to the extent of carrying out capital punishment. So when they lost that early uh, during the idea of uh, Rome over them and the, one of the early Roman procurators over them took, took that right away. Remember, he was a guy from Chicago. His name was Al Caponius. <laughs> Caponius. This could be on a test, so it's a way to remember. Uh, he takes that right away. And then we quoted from uh, Dr. Mark Eastman's book that he wrote with Pastor Chuck, The Search of the Messiah, that rabbis wept in the street because they believed they had missed the Messiah's coming. But they hadn't missed him. He was a 12-year-old boy uh, in the temple. And certainly when Jesus comes again, he will have that scepter. He will rule and reign. And to him shall be the obedience of all the people as he sets up his kingdom. So again, the first gospel promises a deliverer. It's going to be a seed of the woman. Uh, the lineage of the Messiah had to be able to survive the flood. And he does that through Noah's family and through the lineage of Shem. Uh, and then in chapter 12, we find the Messiah would come through Abraham. In chapter 21, through his son Isaac. In chapter 25, through his son Jacob. Uh, in, in chapter 49, through the lineage of the tribe of Judah. Later again, we would find out through the prophets, he would come in the lineage of King David and return as the line of the tribe of Judah. And when Jesus comes on the scene... He's got his genealogical record all lined up, pulls it out of his wallet, unrolls it. He's able to present his genealogical record to prove that he matches everything that was said, not only in terms of his credentials and his lineage, but all the prophecies that needed to be fulfilled. Again, that's why we say Christianity is, exp is, uh, is by its very nature based on reason and based on reasoned ar arguments. So there, Genesis gives us this, this whole picture. Uh, origins, the question of origins and where we come from. Uh, the cause of evil in this world and the cure for mankind's predicament. And now you know everything <laughs> to be able to go out and share your faith. You understand why this is so important? This is just foundational. In the beginning, it's the book of the beginning, so it explains. It's like building a house. If you don't have the foundation, it's kind of hard to start putting things up again. Just, just with a few simple things of knowing about origins, that the universe had a beginning, you can share with a lot of people that have a whole lot of different views uh, and bring them around to at least understand that they should examine uh, the, the claims of Jesus Christ. And if you can get to who Jesus is, his miracles, predictive prophecy, and you can get to the evidence for uh, his resurrection from the dead, uh, if they're not saved, just hit them over the head. No, uh, if they're not saved, that's all right. You, you're just delivering the mail. God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that saves people. But uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says we're to be ready always to give every man an answer, a reasoned answer uh, for the hope that we have within. And, of course, the reminder to do it with a loud, agitated voice. No, to do it with <laughs> gentleness and meekness. We're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to win somebody for the kingdom of God. And uh, anyway, so uh, there's the review. I hope it help, helps you because you'll get tested <laughs> in the days ahead. Uh, and here's, here's, why, here's my suggestion anyway and why, why we do some of what we do. Uh, we take everything and we put it on, on our website for you. Uh, we take every note we hand out for you and we put it on our website for you. So when somebody asks you something about origin, it's like, man, I'm pretty sure we covered that. Yeah, I, I don't expect you to remember everything. I can't either. That's why I've got notes in front of me. I'm just not uh, up here reading and rambling on. Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty structured going through this. So at that point, you can go, I think we covered that. And you can go to our website. You can, you can download the notes. Okay, I think it's in point three. You don't even have to listen to the whole message. You can just <laughs> start downloading and take your little cursor and go, I think it's in the second half of the message. Just move it over and listen to it once again. Make a couple of notes you'll be ready to give someone an answer. It's a resource that we've, we've created. 
and uh, and Genesis is so critical that uh, that uh, we need these kinds of information if we're really going to be the, the light of the world and the salt that's needed in our society today because we want to see men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ that's that's our primary purpose for existence and hope that this helps you well let's pray Lord we thank you that uh, We've come to know you, Lord, that we have a relationship with you. And, uh, and many, like myself, it was just probably just desperation. We just, we just needed to be saved. Just give us the simple gospel. I don't need a lot of arguments or a lot of reasons, but, Lord, as we go through life, we find out that some people do need reasons. Some people do need uh, reasoned arguments so that they can understand who you are. Lord, and I pray that as we studied, as Nehemiah suggested, that because we understand that you're the creator, wow, we should really want to worship you. Because we understand the predicament that we are in, the only cure was if you were willing to send your only son, your only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And our faith in you and what you've done for us, not what we do for you, what you've done for us, our faith in that by your grace saves us, Lord, and that should cause us to love you. And as we continue to stumble along in this life and sin at times, and you forgive us completely, it should cause us to love you more. And I pray that uh, that would be true for every person here, Lord. We'd be continually to grow through the study of your word, your Holy Spirit working through your holy word in our hearts that we might love you more, understand your grace in a greater way because your word says, he that's forgiven much will love much. I pray that we come to understand how much it is that we've been forgiven, how much it is that you've done for us. Lord, so we just commit these things to you in Jesus' name.